In this video, we're going to cover the second half of the viewport toolbar. Now, currently, because I'm recording at such a low resolution, we can't really see all of the buttons included on, the, uh, on this half of the toolbar. I can fix that by grabbing the central divider bar here and dragging it out to the right so that now we can see the rest of the buttons. But a much nicer approach would be to go ahead and just maximize the viewport, which can be done with a maximize viewport button like so. And now you see everything, and then we actually have some excess room, which we don't really need. But it's nice to have all the same. Now, the very first button that we're going to take a look at is the lock viewport button. Now, Logan, can you give us a quick overview of what this button does? Well, the lock viewport button is meant to be used in conjunction with the align cameras command. Ooh. That's a command accessible from the light, uh, excuse me, right-click menu for an actor. <laughs> That's right. So let's go ahead and unmaximize the viewport. We'll bring back the four view for just a second. And what I'm going to do is pick on any given actor. Let's say there's a little path node hiding over here in the floor. I'm going to right-click on it and choose the align cameras option. And as soon as I do that, all four of my viewports jump so that that actor is now centered in all of the views. However, there might come some circumstance where you don't really want a particular viewport to make that jump. For instance, I might have the top viewport centered on this teleporter, and I don't want it to move for some reason. In order to make that happen, all I need to do is invoke lock viewport. And now if I move everything around, let's go ahead and get everybody kind of put back out into outer space for a moment. I can right-click on that actor again, choose Align Cameras, and boom, everybody moves except for our top viewport because the lock viewport option had been activated. Now, uh, of course, to the right of this, we've, we have a button we've already discussed more or less. That is the Maximize Viewport button. It is just a way to make your viewport get large and take up the entire viewport area. That's really all there is to it. But it is very convenient if you'd like some more real estate space to really have a good look in your view. I know a lot of times when I'm decorating a level, I'll spend a lot of time in the perspective view with it completely maximized so I can get a better, clearer picture of what the level is going to look like to a player without having to visualize a little tiny section of my screen. All right, to the right of this, we have the lock selected actors to the camera button. Now, this is a really loaded option. Logan, would you like to give us kind of an overview of what this uh, option is for? Well, as the name suggests, it allows you to take any actor that you wish and lock its position to the camera such that as long as the mode is left enabled, that actor will continue to be dragged along behind the camera or locked to the exact location. It's useful if you want to use the position and rotation of the camera to influence another actor. Now, that's a, a really cool way to put it. Let's... Let's simplify it down a little bit. Let's say you want to, you're trying to position a light. And, you know, in the real world, how would you position a light? Well, you just grab it and you'd aim it at something. You just take a spotlight. You don't think about rotating it on the x-axis and then on the y-axis. And to really drive this home, what I'm going to do is create a couple of lights. And I'm actually going to create more than one, and I'll show you why once we get into it. So let's start off by going to the generic browser, which is available here from the toolbar. I'm going to click on the Open Generic Browser Window button. And then I'm going to move over one tab to the Actor Classes browser. I'm going to expand light. Let me actually scroll down so you can see what we're doing here. I'm going to expand the light option, and we have a spotlight. So that's the kind of light that you'd see yourself maybe aiming. You know, maybe you work at a theater or something. So let's close down uh, the Actor Classes browser. I'm going to right-click on the floor and choose Add Spotlight here. And I'll use my uh, transformation widget, and we'll just pick this up into the air. And then I'm going to hold down the Alt key and drag this guy off to the left. So actually I have two separate spotlights. Now I'll show you why I created two here in just a moment. But first let's talk about how we would move this, how we'd rotate this object into place, this spotlight. In general, you would need to uh, hit the space bar and go over to your rotation widget. You could also choose the rotation widget uh, up from the toolbar like so. And you would need to rotate this along each one of its individual axes. So, for example, I could rotate it on its x-axis, and then I could rotate it in z, and try to get it positioned, maybe aim it at those screens in that fashion. But that's not really the way that you would do it in the real world. In the real world, you just kind of put your head over by the light and you just kind of intuitively aim it at something. And that is what the lock selected actors to the camera button is all about. What I'm going to do is activate lock selected actors to the camera. And then I'm just going to click on this other light. And suddenly our viewport changes. Now, Logan, what has just happened to the viewport? Well, what's happened is you activated the mode before you selected an actor. And in doing that, the moment you selected the actor with the mode enabled, it caused the viewport to snap its location over to whatever object was selected, the one that you clicked on, in this case, the spotlight. That's right. So we've actually taken the camera and put it in the same position and rotation as the light. So now we're essentially looking through that spotlight. Exactly. Almost as if the spotlight itself were a camera. And this blue X, what is that, Logan? Well, that's just part of the, uh, the white 
wireframe drawing of a directional actor. A spotlight is, in fact, directional, and therefore the editor is going to draw a little arrow emanating from the uh, icon. That's right. So anytime you've seen it on some of the directional actors that have an arrow that shows which way they're pointing, we're just staring at the back right, side of that arrow. Yeah, we're staring straight down the arrow, and it's a four-pointed arrow, so it looks like a cross from this view. Now, here's the cool thing. As I navigate the viewport now, I am actually rotating this light. This light is coming along for the ride, which is kind of a cool effect if I switch over into game mode now, because now it's like my perspective camera has a headlight on it. I go to that dark corner that's over there, and as I come in, it gets brighter because we're actually connected to a spotlight. If I deactivate lock selected actors to the camera and back the viewport away and get out of game mode, you can see that I have moved this spotlight, and it is aiming right there at that corner exactly where I wanted it to. So it's a much more intuitive way to go about positioning an actor, especially a directional actor, because you can point it at exactly what you're looking at. Right, it's a very easy way of copying the positional properties of the, uh, of the viewport and placing them on any actor you desire. That's right. Now, if I already have the actor selected, I can activate lock selected actors to the camera and then just move the viewport and something else is going to happen. Boom. Notice that the spotlight disappeared. What happened was kind of the opposite effect. Instead of the viewport going to the actor, the actor has now gone to the viewport. And I did that by not selecting the actor after I had the button. In fact, doing it in the reverse order. Having the actor selected, activating lock selected actors to the camera, and then nudging the viewport. It takes the actor and snaps it exactly to the view. Right, it's, it's nice to know the, uh, the different intricacies of the way that works because there can be times where you want to specifically look through an actor even more than moving it and knowing that you would activate the mode and then click the actor. There might be other times where you have the viewport in the perfect location and you want to snap the light to it without having to completely reset the viewport. But I'll tell you, this is also very handy for cameras that you might have to place in your scene for cinematic sequences because you could take the view and just put it... I, mean, I want to be looking right at this sign, then just uh, select the camera activate lock selected actors to the camera and nudge the viewport just a minuscule amount and that camera is going to snap right to this location and orientation. And that's really what it's all about. It's about uh, bringing those actors along with the viewport and you can do it such that the viewport goes to the actor or the actor goes to the viewport. All right, moving on from here, we have set this viewport to be the occlusion parent. And this is kind of a technical uh, subject to broach, but to really show it off, I'm going to step away from uh, our maximized viewport for a second. Let's go ahead and make our viewports a little more equal in size. And I'm going to take the perspective view and activate this option. So the uh, perspective view is going to become the occlusion parent. And as soon as I do this, some things happen. First off, you'll notice the levels seem to disappear, at least in the top view, and all the other viewports say occlusion child. Now let me zoom out here in the top view. You'll notice the, the level is hiding over here. And as I move around in the perspective view, take a look at what is happening to the level, especially over here in the top view. It's a great place to look at it. The level is slowly disappearing. Would you like to tell them what's going on, Logan? Well, what's happening is what we're, what we're doing is we're using the perspective viewport's optimization, that is to occlude anything that it cannot see. But we're taking that occlusion and applying it to all of the viewports now. So anything that is being occluded from the perspective viewport is being hidden so that it doesn't draw and doesn't slow the game down, is also being hidden or occluded in all of the occlusion children as well. So that way, even though the top view should be able to see the entire level at the moment, it doesn't because it's been made an occlusion child, and it's respecting the occlusion generated from the perspective view. That's right. In a nutshell, anything the occlusion parent can't see, nobody else can either. So there's a quick look at that option, just kind of a nice way to get an idea of the occlusion from multiple angles. Let's go ahead and re-maximize this view now, and we'll turn this feature off because we don't really need it anymore. To the right of this, we have the show flags, and if we click on this, there are a lot of these. Essentially, a show flag is just a way to show or hide some specific article in your viewport. There's a lot of different things you could hide. For example, we could hide static meshes and our level becomes pretty barren. Uh, we could hide BSP, and now we actually just see the open grid. And then we could hide sprites if we wanted to. And then with that, just about everything is gone. So let's go ahead and start bringing some stuff back. We'll bring back static meshes first, and you can still see most of the level is just static meshes. We'll bring back our BSP. And then let's go ahead and bring back our sprites. Now, you will notice in that list that several of these options have been slaved to hotkeys. So if I want to hide BSP on the quick, I can just hit the Q key, and BSP will disappear. If I want to hide static meshes, I can hit the W key, and those will disappear as well. So a great way to turn stuff like that on and off with just a quick stroke of a key. 
Now, uh, to the left, we have two... I'm sorry, to the right. I know my left and my, my right. I really do. Uh, we have two buttons that I'm going to kind of describe in general, but I'm not going to demonstrate them because they're a little bit beyond the scope of, uh, of what we really need to cover here. But we have level streaming volume previs. And what this button does when active is if you're using any level streaming volumes, and what that is is a volume that is set up in order to make level streaming possible. In short, without trying to turn it into a lecture all in its own, uh, there is a way to stream in levels, multiple levels into the same environment where while you are within the span of a volume, while you're within the area of a volume, you can see a level. As soon as you leave that volume, the level disappears. Well, if you turn on level streaming volume previs, that behavior will become true. So while the camera, like in the perspective viewport, is within one of those volumes, that level will become visible. As soon as you leave that volume, the level will disappear. And it's, again, it's not something that I'm going to be demonstrating here, just kind of give you a general overview of what it does. Now, to the right of this, we have post-process volume previs, which is kind of the same thing for post-processes. There is a, uh, a type of volume you can set up inside of Unreal called a post-process volume, and while your player or while the camera is within the area of that volume, a post-process effect will be applied to the camera. So you can set it up to where when a player goes into a specific room, maybe their vision gets clouded because it's full of some sort of poisonous gas. There's all sorts of things you could do. But as long as this button is active, if you set up a scenario like that you'll see the effect on your camera as you move around and that's what this is all about now to the right of this we have squint mode and this will make you think that uh, you need glasses and the point of this is so that you can get an idea of the general uh, flow of the colors in your scene you'll get an idea of what's lit what's not lit without having to squint your eyes there's kind of a, a technique and I know that I, I've used this a lot as a web designer and as uh, working with images where you just kind of rock back from your monitor squint your eyes down and allow your vision to blur so that you can get a general idea of how colors are flowing, what your composition looks like, and that sort of thing. And it's also very useful in levels to get an idea of what your level generally looks like. See if your colors and your lighting is working. And this is just a way to do that without having to squint and strain your eyes. You can just turn this on and off. Now, a quick side note, which is a tad beyond the scope of this discussion, but it might come in useful to you. If you think maybe this is blurring a bit too much, you can go under View, Come down under World Properties, and you'll notice that under these properties, if you expand World Info, you'll see Squint Mode Kernel Size. And if you take this and maybe set it down to, say, 64, uh, your kernel is going to get a bit smaller. You can set it all the way down to 1, and notice our blur almost completely disappears. The default, of course, is 128, so you can customize that if you need to. Okay, moving to the right here, we have three more buttons, and these are all very easy. These allow you to control the speed of your camera. By default, your camera moves at a fairly slow speed, which for a level this small works out great. But if you're trying to get across a very large level and you find yourself having to pick your mouse up and set it back down or you know, constantly re-click to get over there and it's just taking too long, you can speed up your mouse and see I've just clicked over to the very fastest speed. And let me switch on real time so that motion blur doesn't get in the way anymore. But now we're moving a whole lot more quickly. Basically, we're covering more ground with less motion from the mouse. Right, it's very useful because of the driving motion that the mouse uses in order to navigate to the level. It means that as you move the mouse, it's almost like your camera is locked to the mouse. That, of course, means that if you have to move a great distance, you'll have to physically pick the mouse up and put it back down somewhere else on the desk to continue scrolling. Whereas if you change the speed, you can get a lot more distance out of each scroll. That's right. Now, the, the drawback to that is if you're looking for some side, sort of intricate mouse motion, like let's say I wanted to put the camera into this little alcove and turn around 180 degrees, that becomes a little bit tricky. I can still do it, but it's a, a lot more imprecise. Like, yeah, I've just flown down through the floor, where if I was moving at a slow pace, it'd be a lot easier to get the exact motion I was looking for. So, of course, you'll find yourself adjusting between these speeds fairly often, depending on what you're doing. If you need to cover a lot of distance, of course, switch it over to fastest. If you're doing something intricate, do slowest. And if you're looking for some sort of middle ground, you have a normal camera speed as well, though I've never really known what normal is anyway. So I think that is going to wrap up everything I wanted to cover in this video. Uh, between this and the first part of, uh, of the viewport toolbar, you should now have all of these buttons covered, and that'll wrap things up. Thanks.